Okay, so to start off with, we're going to start talking about why arbitrary cutoffs um, in policies and programs matter for making causal inferences with regression discontinuity. Um, this is something that sets regression discontinuity off uh, from other natural experiment approaches like difference and difference or instrumental variables. Um, in this case, having some sort of rule that determines who can access a program and who cannot, um, while that might be arbitrary and people get angry at that in the real world for not being able to access a program if they're right on the, board, on the boundary of accessing it, it's actually really good for making causal inferences about the effectiveness of that program. And so you can use that, that cutoff to, to make inferences. Um, and there are lots of programs in the world that use rules to determine who can access the program. Um, and they're often based on some sort of arbitrary rule that somebody decides you must have a score of X to enter the program or not. Um, being able to enter into this program, you had to take the GRE, you had to have a GPA at a certain level, you had to meet certain requirements, and if you didn't meet those, you didn't get in. Um, but if you did meet them, then you were able to get in. Um, and so lots of policies have these, these thresholds. And so this is the, the key thing you have to remember, is you, there are policies in the world that have some sort of threshold, and if you're above it, then you get to get into the program, and if you're below it, then you don't. Um, so some key terms that we're going to use throughout our discussion about regression discontinuity here. Um, you have this thing called a running variable or a forcing variable. Um, this is the thing that lets you get into the program or not into the program. So in the case of getting into GSU, um, one of your running variables was your GRE score. Um, you also had GPA. Um, for lots of social policies, your running variable is income. Um, for other policies, it might be a test that you have to take. It might be um, the number of people in your household. Um, some sort of measure that determines whether or not you get into a program. Um, the other thing we care about is the actual cutoff. So this is the cutoff or the cut point or the threshold. It's some point in that running variable that determines whether or not you get into the program. If you're above it or below it, then you're in or out. It's the, the number that formally assigns you to the program. Um, so keep these, these two terms in mind as we talk about this. You have a running variable and you have the cutoff. Um, if we look at DAG language really quick here, um, this actually fits well with everything we've been talking about so far in the semester, um, where you have a program um, that causes some sort of outcome, um, but in order to access the program, you have to be above the cutoff in the running variable. And so if you look here, the running variable causes the program, but it's mediated by this above cutoff node. Um, you can't just be in the program with any value of running variable. You have to be ab above that cutoff, and then you can access the program. And then that lets you then find the outcome. And so as long as we can control for people being above the cutoff or adjust for that in our DAG, we can use this DAG structure to find causal inference um, and find the causal effect of this program on the outcome. And it works pretty well. So keep this DAG in mind, too, as we talk about this. So to give some more examples of, of why we care about these discontinuities here, um, these are the 2019 federal poverty guidelines um, based on household size. And so you can see um, kind of the annual income for a household of one up to a household of eight um, with monthly income. And then you have different percentages of that poverty level. So you have 138, 150, 200, where 200 is just double whatever the, the regular poverty level is. And these are important because lots of social programs are based on your income and how high that income is and what percent of the poverty level it is. Um, there is a whole host of problems with using this poverty level. Um, it hasn't, the, the guidelines haven't been updated in decades. Um, it's based on outdated baskets of goods that people are supposed to buy. Um, there's a whole world of of articles and research about how this isn't great, but it's what is used, so it exists here. Um, so there's a whole host of programs. Um, for instance, Medicaid, in order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to have an income of 138% of the poverty line. And if you're above that, then you don't qualify for Medicaid. Um, 
there's an asterisk there because in some states, um, you can actually, some states have uh, expanded up to 138%. Um, prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was 100% of the poverty line, um, but with the Affordable Care Act, um, many states have expanded that so that you can get Medicaid with a little bit more in annual income. Um, the Affordable Care Act subsidies, you can get uh, subsidies for paying for your health insurance between 138 and 400% of the poverty line. If you're above 400%, then you don't get any subsidies. If you're below 138%, you also don't get any subsidies. And in theory, um, that should cover everybody, but lots of states have not expanded Medicaid. And so those states, um, you have this, this awful threshold where if you're at 110% of the poverty level, you don't qualify for Medicaid um, because you're above the 100% and they didn't expand it, but you're also below the 138 for the Affordable Care Act, and so you can't get Affordable Care Act insurance subsidies and you can't get Medicaid, so you have to pay full price for insurance, which is not great. Um, in order to get CHIP or Children's Health Insurance, um, that's a 200% level of 200% uh, of the poverty level. Um, so if you're at 201%, you don't qualify. If you're 199, you qualify. Um, for food stamps or SNAP or free lunch programs, you have to have 130% of the poverty level. Um, and for programs like reduced lunch, um, where it's not free but it's really, really cheap, um, you have to have an income within this range here, 130 to 185 percent. And if you're above um, that threshold, then you don't qualify. And so um, there are a whole bunch of different federal guidelines um, for a whole host of programs. And so these discontinuities exist everywhere. Um, so for our case, we're going to use an example throughout um, this lecture here for a hypothetical program um, for this academically and intellectually gifted during school program where we'll have simulated data about this test where if you score above 75 on this test in sixth grade, then you get accepted into this AIG program where you can do extra during school activities. Um, and so what we're going to pretend is that at the end of high school, you take some sort of final test and we're going to see if this AIG program boosted people's income, if people had a high enough score on the test and they got into the program. So this is the running example we'll be talking about throughout this lecture here. So given this threshold, um, one thing that's very helpful to do and you see all the time in regression discontinuity analysis is you can plot the scores of your running variable here. And so you can see that the, the AIG scores here range from 30 to 100. Um, there's a line at 75 here at the threshold. And so you can see that people who scored less than 75 don't get to be in the program. People who scored more than 75 got to be in the program. And we can see there's a very clear, nice, clean break here. This is what we call sharp discontinuity. We don't have anybody scoring less than 75 not in the program or more than 75 um, or less than 75 in the program, more than 75 out of the program. So it's nice and clean. Everybody's doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, the reason this is important is because this, having this, this threshold is what fuels the whole idea of causal inference with these, with these programs. Um, where we can assume that the people who scored right before the threshold or right after the threshold are essentially the same type of person. Um, so if we look at this test here, um, I have two different gray areas here showing the bandwidth um, around the cutoff. And so you might have this light gray area that goes um, plus or minus five points. And so what we can say is that somebody who scored 80 and somebody who scored 60 on this program are actually fairly comparable people. Um, it's not like we're comparing somebody who completely bombed the test and got like a 30 with somebody who aced the test with a 100. That's not a very comparable um, group of people there. But if we look at people right near the threshold, um, those in theory are going to be fairly similar people. So if we zoom in here, we can see this better. So you might have somebody right on the line here that scored like a 74.9 and somebody up here that scored like a 75.1. Um, theoretically, those people are the same people. It's just that one guessed well and the other one didn't guess well enough. Maybe somebody had bad luck. Um, somebody didn't eat enough for breakfast that morning. 
um, where had they had an extra banana, maybe they would have gotten an one more point or something. Like people within these gray boundaries are pretty much the same type of people. That's the main causal inference intuition here. Um, and if you can make that assumption safely, then you can start using um, causal inference language. For instance, people who are in that bandwidth right next to the cutoff, those above the cutoff are essentially your treatment group, and those below the cutoff are your control group. And so given that, you can do analysis just like we've been doing with uh, randomized controlled trials, um, and we can call these different groups treatment and control, just because they're slightly off, but basically the same kind of people. And so what we can do is compare the outcomes um, for those people who are right before and right after the uh, threshold, and then we can calculate the difference between um, the treatment and control groups. And so we go back to um, these people who scored different levels on the, on the AIG test here, and then on the y-axis we have their hypothetical end of high school final test um, with a score of up to 100 points. So if we look at this, right at 75 here, where we have the line, there's actually a gap. Um, and that is our delta. That's our treatment effect that we care about. So had, what we can assume is had the people in the test above, or in the program, above 75 points, had they not been in the program, they would have continued with this line here all the way up. Um, but because they were in the program, they got a boost. And so we have a higher line there. Um, and so we can, just like with our diff and diff graphs, that's our, our causal effect. And so what we can do is if we can measure that gap, that delta value, that is the causal effect of being in the AIG program on your final test score. Um, and that is the thing we care about the most. And if we zoom in um, to just um, between five-ish points of, of the threshold, you can see it even better here. We have people who are very, very similar. Again, the people who got 74 and 76 are essentially the same people, but the people who got 76 have slightly higher final test scores. And so you can zoom in and just measure that gap, and that's the thing you care about the most. Um, lots of people have been doing this in real life uh, with really interesting questions that you can't actually run like randomized control trials to get at. Um, so in this study here, um, the, the researchers were interested in whether or not having more time in the day makes it more likely for you to vote. Um, and this is something you can't really run a randomized control trial for. You can't have some people have 25 hours in the day and some people only have 24. You can't control the sun like that. And so what they did instead is they used discontinuities in time zones um, because those are arbitrary things that just exist because the government said that there's a time zone boundary here. And so what they wanted to do was see if people who had kind of more time in the day were able to vote more. And they can't really make people have more time in the day. But what they can do is if you look right here, here's Georgia and here's Alabama. If you live right on the border of Georgia and Alabama on the Georgia side, it is 8 p.m. for you when it's nighttime. But in Alabama, it's only 7 p.m. And it's the same amount of sun outside. Um, and so it feels um, earlier in the day if you're on the west side of the boundary which means you essentially have an extra hour of the day compared to the people on the east coast or the east side of the line. And so given that, what these researchers did is they looked at a whole bunch of different voting districts right on the boundaries of all of the time zones here. And then they compared voter turnout in each of those regions to see if it was higher on one side of the border or not. And not surprisingly, they actually found a difference. And so we can see here, there's the gap that we care about. Um, that people, that districts on the east side of the time zone boundary had lower average uh, voter turnout than, than districts on the west side of the boundary. Um, and so what, they, what the researchers uh, claimed in the end is that having election schedules can cause fluctuations in turnout, which then means having more time in the day makes it more likely that you will vote and it increases voter turnout and so you should have longer um, voting periods and give people more time to vote because that 
allows more people to actually go and get to the polling stations. Um, but they were able to measure this causally using regression discontinuity, which is pretty cool. Um, you can also use discontinuities with time. So in California, um, according to California state law, insurance companies have to cover two days in the hospital after you give a baby, or after you deliver a baby, after you give birth. Um, and so researchers used that um, to see if um, spending more time in the hospital after childbirth um, leads to better health outcomes. Does it lead to healthier babies and to healthier mothers? Um, you can't really have a randomized control trial that way. You can't randomly assign some mothers to be in the hospital for two days and some to be in there for one um, because there are medical, ethical issues with doing that. Um, and so answering this question of does extra time in the hospital improve health outcomes, you can't do that with a randomized control trial. But you can do it with regression discontinuity. Because of this, this policy here, the insurance companies have to pay for two days of a hospitalization. So what these researchers did is they looked at how many midnights people spent in the hospital um, based on when they gave birth. Because if you give birth at um, 12 or at 11.30 at night, um, then you, that counts as part of your day. Um, you have half an hour of your first day. And then the next day is the, your second day. But your next day starts half an hour after you give birth. If, on the other hand, you give birth over here at like 12.01, you have a full day before your first hospital day is over. And so then you get an extra day, essentially. Um, and so they were able to use this discontinuity here um, to see um, if these people who got essentially a free extra day compared to the people who gave birth at like 11.59, um, to see if that difference there caused any outcome or any changes in health outcomes. And so um, they did find that being born at 12.01 makes you stay in the hospital on average longer. Um, you can see they had 1.7 days in the hospital compared to 1.4 um, because not everybody stays the full two days. Um, but then if you look at the outcomes, they're actually insignificant. If you look at this panel here, this is the readmission rate for the mother. And so there's no break right here at midnight. Um, mothers who gave birth at 11.59 weren't more or less likely to come back to the hospital. And if you look at the discontinuity for the, the child mortality rate, um, there's also no discontinuity there. If you were, if you were a baby born at 11.59, you, were, you had the same mortality rate as somebody born at 12.01 who then got an extra day in the hospital. And so what the researchers were able to say was that having an extra day in the hospital doesn't actually cause um, any extra um, health benefit. And so you don't necessarily have to stay in the hospital the full 12 days, uh, or the full two days. Um, and so that's another neat um, research question that they were able to get at um, without running a randomized control trial. Um, the last example we'll talk about here is related to what you're doing right now. Um, researchers were interested in the question of whether or not going to a, the main flagship university in your state um, like UGA um, here in Georgia or the University of Utah or the Univers University of Virginia, um, kind of the main state university, does that cause you to make more money later on? Um, and so should we kind of encourage people to go to the main flagship universities? Um, again, you can't do this with a randomized control trial because of ethical reasons, um, but there are discontinuities here. In order to get into a university, you have to um, meet a certain level of SAT score. And if you don't get a high enough SAT score, then you don't get accepted to the university. And so the researchers were able to exploit this um, discontinuity here and check to see if, um, uh, they were able to use this to see if earnings for people who are just on the border of getting accepted or not were different. And so if we look here at this plot, um, the first plot shows the acceptance rate um, for looking at different SAT scores. And so you can see 
Um, those who were above whatever admission cutoff the state school was using, they were more likely to be accepted. Um, they had like a 50% acceptance rate versus if you were below, you were only at like a 10% acceptance rate. Um, so much lower if you, were, if you didn't have a high enough SAT score, um, which is to be expected. Um, this is good proof that the um, discontinuity works. And so there's a rule-based cutoff, which is good. Um, if we look at their outcomes, though, what we see is there is slightly higher um, average incomes for people who were above the cutoff, which means, again, these are the people who were accepted into the flagship universities. And if you look up here, the actual size of that gap, this is the log earnings, so we can talk about it with percentages, um, being in the flagship university and going there causes a 9.5% increase in your earnings compared to those who didn't go to the flagship university. Um, and so going to UGA boosts your earnings. Going to UVA boosts your earnings. And so it does, it does kind of help. Um, GSU is also in here. I count them as a flagship university. So you will all get higher earnings because of this too. Um, so we care about this. Um, because these, these cutoffs are great for finding causal inference in, in difficult to find things. And they're super popular nowadays. Um, in the past 10 years, they've kind of exploded in popularity and tons of papers are, are using these now. Lots of program evaluations are using these now just because rules exist. Um, and you can just use those rules. And once you, once you start getting used to regression discontinuities, you'll see rules all over the place. Um, and then you'll start thinking of, of cool research designs around those rules um, and trying to determine if you can measure social outcomes based on whatever rules you see. And so people love, the, love these things, um, in part because they are really compelling um, and they're intuitive. Um, trying to explain, somebody, explain to somebody how instrumental variables causes um, different causal outcomes and trying to, to get your head wrapped around that, as you'll see the next time we do this, um, instrumental variables are weird. Um, that's one of their qualifications. They have to be unintuitive. And so if you're communicating your causal effect to an audience that doesn't understand instrumental variables, good luck with that. Um, with diff and diff, as we saw, there's issues with um, staggered rollouts. There's all sorts of issues. You have to make sure you have good treatment and control groups um, across states, and that's, that can be hard. Um, but with regression discontinuity, the whole intuition of the people right below and above the border are the same, that's compelling and everybody kind of understands that intuitively. And so it, it's a good way of, of explaining um, your research design. Um, this, this paper just came out recently that actually shows that um, regression discontinuity designs are less susceptible to p-hacking and selective publication. Um, this means you can manipulate your, your model results until you get a good p-value. And if you can't get a good p-value, then you don't publish it, and that's selective publication. Um, difference and difference and instrumental variables suffer from p-hacking and selective publication a lot. Um, these researchers examined 13,000 different hypothesis tests, and they found that there was all sorts of p-hacking. Um, but it was significantly less for research designs that used regression discontinuity um, and randomized control trials. This doesn't mean that the results are automatically more credible. It doesn't mean that we should not believe um, diff and diff or instrumental variables. It just means that um, it's kind of harder to fake your way into a good result um, as long as you do it well. And it's, it's more compelling and, and people will, will eat this stuff up when you present this stuff. Um, so that is kind of the theoretical background for regression discontinuity.